ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, you know what time it is? It's time to worship God. So welcome to Happy Hour at the World Famous Salvation Salute Water and Home Church. Get ready to be blessed. So sit back, hang on, enjoy the ride as we take you out of this crazy world and into a spirit-filled, life-changing gospel show service. Already in progress. All right, that's and here we are. We all survived this downluge, deluge of water. Huh? No one drowned on the way in. Doesn't look like. So we are so happy to have you here at Salvation Saloon, Water and Old Church, and uh, we're going to have us a good time today because that's how we do things around here. We worship the Lord and we have a good time doing it. Amen. That's right. Amen. my regrets I was a wretched man but you called me on down to the water met me by the riverside you took me in you drowned my sin and said dead man come alive then I left it in the water my yesterdays are history I left it in the water I went down dirty, but I came out clean. Left it, left it, left it, left it, left left it in the water. God, I still got my struggles. You close up to the broken heart. Lord, even when I'm falling, I'm falling in mercy. Blinding me with your light You took me in Drawn my sins And dead men come alive And I left it in the water My yesterdays are history I left it in the water I went down dirty But I came up clean Left it Left it Left it Left it, left it, left it in the water going to have us a fine time because you know in spite of everything when you've got the Lord in your heart <coughs> Lord in your life you have one thing that most people don't have and that is the satisfied 
mine. one version of this song, which is a great version. It's very different, but it's time we get back to some basics and some fundamentals because we need to do this song the way it was kind of written because it's a very special song, and I think we all know this. And the most important part is you guys have to sing with us. <laughs> you have to well, you don't them. have to, but... No, yes, they have. To. Oh, she's a woman. She's in charge. Yes. <laughs> well, we are worshiping the Lord. And so everybody here has a joyful noise. So you better follow us and help us, please. <laughs> when peace Thank you. 
celebrate this glorious thought. He's taken all our sins and nailed them to the cross. Take us to the mansion he's prepared. And the Lord pays the day. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Happy Hour at the World Famous Salvation Saloon. And for those of you who just may be here for the first time, uh, we always start our services out by letting you guys know we are so glad you guys are here. And we truly believe God's going to bless you guys. Uh, there is one thing we would ask of you, though, if you don't mind, and that is if you just grab one of these little yellow cards you see all over the place. And if you would, uh, just uh, throw your name in that. Tell us where you're from. That'd be cool. Uh, but then if you don't mind, if you just hold on to this card till the end of the service and write down the bottom in the comments section, 
Uh, tell us what you thought. We're always kind of curious. So if you do that, that would be great. And uh, then on your way out the door, you'll see a bucket. You can then throw that card in that bucket. Uh, but again, welcome to the Salvation Saloon. We're so glad you guys are here. And uh, from here on out, you're our guest. So sit back, hang on, and enjoy the ride. Now, the rest of us, we all know there are some other purposes for these cards, though. And that is if there happens to be a birthday or an anniversary or uh, could be just about anything you think we've got to know about, well, you can put it uh, on this card one week in advance. Uh, but the main reason we have these cards is for prayer. So if you have a need in your life, uh, put that need down on this card and give God an opportunity to show himself strong because prayer does work. Amen? This is what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells that our God is a present help in times of trouble, uh, but also tells that sometimes we have not because we ask not. So put your needs down on this card. All right, well, here at the Salvation Slew, we are a family, like every family. Well, we try to make sure we recognize each other. Now, um, this week we have no anniversaries or birthdays, but uh, we do have that game we play each and every week. And the name of that game is Name That Salunatic. And how that works is uh, we usually get an old picture thrown up and try to guess who it is. And uh, see what you can do with this. See if you can tell me who this Salunatic is. Stumping you guys? Mike Baker, Dave George. Someone says Pat, Brenda. Well, let's find out. Will the real Salunatic please stand up? It's Pat Barnett, right there. Very good. All right, we're well, moving right along. I don't think we have anything else to share with you guys today, so uh, we need, obviously need to start things off right, and so uh, I'm going to get Jason up here, and uh, he is going to pray God's blessing in the remainder of our service. Here's Jason. you guys are a fan of the organized church, this might not be the place for you today. <laughs> uh, Rob is missed. Uh, I was doing my devotions this morning. I just finished uh, Second Chronicles, and there's a little snippet about providence. Uh, and I thought I would share about some providence in my life. Uh, I was in my mid-30s, recently divorced, and actually quite happy. I spent my weekends with my older kids. Uh, you guys remember Riley. Uh, I went to work and I went to the gym every day. And I liked it. You know, when I didn't have the kids, I went to work and had the kids on weekends. Uh, and I was actually firmly set that this is what I was going to do. That's, I'm content. This is good. Uh, I actually had a great gym because no one else went there. So it was all mine. Uh, <laughs> and that's what I did. It was great. Uh, and then uh, there was this girl at work named Angela. I remember looking in the mirror and saying, this girl's going to be trouble. I, not that she showed any interest in me, but I was like, no, no. It's just give her a wide berth. Uh, and I actually remember telling one of my coworkers that whatever guy tricks this girl into marrying her is going to be the luckiest guy on the, place, on the face of this planet. Except then I cursed more, so I had a couple more in there. But... Uh, one thing led to another, and uh, she was not a Christian when I met her, um, and I say that I led her to the Lord, and she led me back to the Lord, but really, I was present when the Spirit moved, and she used me and others around me as a resource. Um, the Spirit called her, and then she was so good at, good at being a Christian that uh, I kind of had to step up my game. Um, I, claimed <laughs> I claimed to be a Christian. I grew up a Christian. But she just did it better. Uh, so she definitely led me back to the Lord. Um, and then this crazy whirlwind happened. We had a, <laughs> the accident I spoke of in the past. Uh, I came home one day and said, 
Angela, I got accepted into uh, respiratory school today. And she said, I didn't know you were even going to try. <laughs> and I said, and then she followed it with, uh, what does this mean? And then I said, well, I'm going to be busy for a couple of years. And she said, well, two years are going to go by anyways. Might as well be a respiratory therapist at the end. Um, and then that led to traveling, which led me here to this crazy little church, this wonderful people. Um, but Providence, man, I did not think or dream of any of this. God planned it for me. He laid this out. He sent her to me to save me from myself. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing how when you surrender, you find freedom. Amen. You know? It's uh, the real freedoms when you just stop trying to control everything. Uh, well, that's my little pulpit for today. I'm done. Uh, let's pray for the offering. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you do. Thank you for making those plans that we didn't even know that we needed. Uh, we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking we're on the right path or content, but there is only one path, and the path leads straight to you. Um, pray for this church. Pray for this message that Paul is going to share with us, um, that we get what we need out of it. Um, we pray for this offering that it becomes a tool for you. Uh, we pray for the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we, uh, we introduced this song to you guys last week, and, and as I said then, and I still believe now, this is one of those special songs that comes along very seldom. But one of the things that, that has been important to me to understand, and I think we've all, we've all encountered it, is that, you know, being a Christian comes with some wonderful things. But there, life still happens. We live in a, we live in a, in this world, and in this world, bad things can happen, and it can break us down, and it can hurt us, and and we have to learn how to endure it. But this song kind of captures everything that that we think about, and that we should be thinking about, when we find ourselves in desperation, because we don't, we are not in desperation alone. I believe, I believe, I believe, 
I believe You're working all things for my good You're working all things Everything's gonna be alright Everything's gonna be alright You hold me in your arms Until my storm is gone Everything's gonna be alright Everything's gonna be alright Your love will be my song Until my fears are gone And I believe I believe I believe I believe You're working all things for my good You're working all things for my good And I believe I believe Oh, I believe I believe working all things for my good. You're working all things for my good. Praise God. All right. Thank you, Nitty Gritty Church Band. Good stuff. Amen. All right. So uh, it was last week um, that we began Chapter 23 of Luke's Gospel. And so by way of review, uh, here's where we're at. Uh, Jesus and his disciples, they're in Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, so he's had his, already had his, his triumphant entry. Uh, and then it's at the Last Supper that he establishes through the bread and the wine the purpose of his uh, soon-to-come uh, sacrifice. Uh, but it was also at that Last Supper that Judas, one of the twelve, uh, well, he was uh, exit stage right as he uh, left to betray Jesus and betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And then it was at the Garden of, the, of Gethsemane uh, that the soldiers arrived and uh, Jesus is placed into custody. Um, but it's in fear that uh, they would also be arrested as, as accomplices, that his disciples, well, they then uh, go into hiding. Uh, although as for Peter, uh, he uh, continued to follow Jesus, uh, but he followed him from what he thought was a, a safe distance. Um, but when he's still recognized as a disciple, that is when, just as Jesus had told him, uh, he denies him on three occasions. Now, it was also last time uh, that the Jews had placed Jesus on trial, and they found him guilty, uh, guilty of blasphemy, and they sentenced him to death. Uh, but here's the problem. The problem is, is that only Rome can carry out a sentence of death. So these Jews, what they need to do is they now have to get Rome to accept the charges, right? But here's the thing, and we discussed this last time, um, and, and that is why would Rome accept a charge of blasphemy when they don't even recognize the, the Jewish God, right? Uh, and they don't recognize the Jewish God because to them, well, Caesar is, is their God. So this is what the Jews do. Uh, they uh, then uh, turn Jesus over to Pilate, the Roman governor, and they fabricate a bunch of lies, right? A bunch of lies to make it look like Jesus, uh, this self-proclaimed Messiah and king, um, would, would be uh, indeed a threat uh, to Rome. Uh, but Pilate, Pilate kind of knew what they were doing, and, um, and he wanted no part of this. He wanted no part of a, an innocent man's execution. And so he stood before them, and uh, he uh, told them that he found no basis for any uh, charges. Uh, but these Jews, um, they were not backing down, right? They were not going to take no for an answer. And, um, and so what I actually didn't mention last time is that uh, Pilate, he, he'd been called on the carpet uh, a number of times for being insensitive to the Jews and, and their traditions. And so the last thing that he needed was for this 
uh, situation to get out of hand and, and then have that news make it, its way back to Rome. So Pilate takes this custom, which we mentioned last time, uh, this custom that allowed him to release a, a prisoner of the people's choosing. And so what he does is he puts Jesus beside this uh, very violent criminal named Barabbas. Uh, and, and this is what he's thinking. He's thinking that there's just no way that they would choose him over Jesus. But they did, right? But they did. And, and then the, the crowd just gets more and more worked up, and, and they, they, they were now demanding that Jesus be crucified. And uh, that's when finally uh, Pilate just uh, gives in, yet he literally washes his hands of the situation in front of them all. Now, from there, the, the first stop in, in the protocol for a Roman execution w was the whipping post, right? Which is uh, where the condemned person would be severely uh, whipped or, or flogged uh, in an attempt to extract a, a confession. Now, we discussed this also, and here's the thing with that. Um, if, if a confession was received, um, the beating would then be much more lenient, right? But if no confession was received then in the attempt to force that confession, the beating would then be, become progressively much more brutal. Um, but just as Messianic prophecy declared right in Isaiah 53, uh, it stated there that the Messiah would be oppressed and afflicted, yet he would not open his mouth. So in the case of Jesus, no confession meant no mercy. And, and that is what he willingly submitted to for the sake of, of our salvation. Um, and so, just as the Bible said, we were bought with a price, amen? We were bought with a price. Now, it's at this point that Mark's gospel tells us this. Mark's gospel tells us that the, the soldiers then led Jesus away, uh, but as they did, they mocked him, and, and they mocked him by putting a, a purple robe on him. Now, that signified something, right? Uh, purple was the color of royalty. And, and so to then complete their sick little joke, they then set a crown of thorns on, on the head of Jesus. All right, let's think about that. Let's think about those, those thorns, because where did they come from? Well, they came from the fall of man. Right? They came from the fall of man when sin entered the world and the ground was cursed. And now, well, now here's Jesus who is about to bear that curse of sin, by allowing all of it, all that sin to be placed on him. And so um, that crown of thorns was symbolically appropriate. Uh, anyways, he submitted to all of this, right? Submitted to all of this for us, including the humiliation that these soldiers then subjected him to. And, and that was uh, they, they spit on him and they struck him with their staffs and, and they started shouting uh, to, the, to the people, uh, all hail the king of the Jews. All hail the king of the Jews. Anyways, at this point, Jesus is, is in a uh, very weakened state. And so when he was given the cross at, at that point to carry to the crucifixion site, uh, he just did not have the strength. And so, as we now pick things up uh, from there, well, verse uh, 26 tells us this. It tells that as the soldiers led him away... They then seized uh, this man named Simon, Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. So here's this Simon. Um, he's just arrived uh, in Jerusalem for the Passover. And when he gets there, the Roman soldiers, they, uh, they put that cross on him and they made him carry it behind Jesus. So uh, the Roman soldiers, they, they order this, this Simon guy to help. And I was thinking about that, um, because I guess you could uh, actually say that he literally knew what it meant to carry a cross and follow Jesus. Amen? <laughs> literally knew. Anyways, what, what do we know about this guy, this, this guy named Simon? Well, as it told us here, we know he's from Cyrene, um, which is in northern Africa. Uh, that, that would actually be modern-day Libya. Uh, and, and that tells us something, right? It tells us that this guy came a long way to to celebrate the, the Passover. Uh, and since he journeyed like hundreds and hundreds of miles, I mean, it's very likely that he had, you know, little or no knowledge at all of who this Jesus guy was. And yet, 
And yet, because of this experience that he goes through here, uh, it's believed that he became a believer uh, because of it. And his faith was then passed on to his family. And, and why do we believe that? We, we believe that because the New Testament actually lists his sons as being leaders in the early church, uh, which is kind of cool. So um, this was not just some chance encounter here, um, but this was God's providence in, in this man's life. Now, uh, what, what the soldiers were asking him to do um, by carrying that cross, that was actually a law, right? Because in the commission of, of his job, a Roman soldier could order a citizen to carry his load. But he could only order him to do that for the distance of, of one mile. Now, maybe you guys remember when Jesus said, right? G- Jesus said, if, if someone compels you to go a mile, then go with him two miles, so in, in teaching us to go above and beyond for the others, Jesus was actually using this very, uh, very law right here as an example. Anyways, as Jesus is now, he's, he's making his way to the crucifixion. And verse 27 says uh, that a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And in verse 28, it then tells us this. It tells us that Jesus turned and he said to them, daughters of Jerusalem... Do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. So essentially, don't be crying over my suffering, but cry for those who who are going to reject my suffering. Cry for those who are going to reject the sacrifice of their Messiah. And then Jesus says this in verse 29. And that is, he, he says, The time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Because in verse 30, they will then say to the mountains, fall on us, and say to the hills, cover us. Now, maybe you remember uh, a couple chapters ago, um, Jesus said some similar stuff, right? He said, said, woe to those with child and to those who nurse. And there, he was speaking in reference to the destruction of Jerusalem that he had predicted uh, would take place. Um, But here's a question. I mean, why at this point, as Jesus is on his way to the cross, um, why would he now choose to mention that future destruction of of Jerusalem? I mean, it kind of seems unrelated. But if we go back to chapter 19, well, we find that after Jesus spoke about that future event, well, it it was also there that he explained why this event would happen. And, And it was because they did not recognize the time of God's coming. Or in other words, um, because they rejected the salvation that Jesus is in the midst of providing them right now. So this is is related. Uh, And in verse 31, as Jesus who then says this, he says, for if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? For people do these things when the tree is green, Alive. What will happen when it's dry? Dead and dry. All right. A couple different thoughts. Well, there's a lot of different thoughts as to what this actually means. Um, But in the context of what's being discussed here, um, then how about consider this, right? How about consider that this green tree is, is speaking of the good and the innocent, speaking of the spiritually alive, while that dry tree would be speaking of the bad and, and the guilty, the spiritually dead. And so essentially, this is kind of what I think it means. Essentially, if a good uh, and innocent person such as Jesus could be subjected to the suffering that he is now receiving, then what would be the fate of Jerusalem, who in failing to recognize their own Messiah, um, not only did they reject him, but they even tortured and killed him? Well, you know what? That is a dry, dead tree that one day will kindle the fires of judgment. And sure enough, as we all know, in 70 AD, that took place, right? Just as Jesus had said, right? Their judgment became a, a reality as, as Titus took his siege on Jerusalem, and, and it resulted in over a million Jews uh, being killed in, in the process. And uh, yeah, sad day for mothers. That was a sad day for mothers, a lot of mothers. All right, but now, as Jesus continues towards his execution, 
It's verse 32 that tells us this. tells us that two other men, okay, both criminals, were also led with him to be executed. Now, at this time, it, it, this is like 9 o'clock in the morning. And in verse 33, um, when they came to the place called the Skull, it tells us that they crucified him there along with those criminals. Uh, one was on his right and the other on his left. And so we see that fulfills prophecy, the prophecy that said the Messiah would be numbered with the transgressors. Um, we're actually going to get to know these guys a little better here in just a couple verses. Um, but first, let, let's just go back and, and uh, look at this place called the Skull. Now, in Aramaic, uh, it, it's called Golgotha, and in Latin, it's called Calvary. Um, and uh, is that the picture? As you can see, it does resemble a skull, doesn't it? Uh, if that is indeed the, the place um, where Jesus was crucified. Now, uh, this place, um, it, all this stuff just fits together so cool. This place is, is located on the northern summit of Mount Moriah, right? Which very appropriately is the very same place where Abraham took his son Isaac to be sacrificed, right? And the same place where Isaac asked his father, where the lamb for the sacrifice was. And in response, remember what Abraham said? Well, he made this prophetic statement when he said, God will provide himself a lamb. God will provide himself. I, I find that kind of an interesting way to put that. Now, another interesting thing to note is that Abraham uh, was asked to sacrifice his only son whom he loved. And that may sound familiar as well. And also, um, did you know this? Um, that was actually the very first time the words love, uh, the word love was ever mentioned in the Bible. Right? And it was mentioned there in reference to a father sacrificing his only, only son on Mount Moriah. And now, right, now here we are, we, here's Jesus. He's at that very same location, right? The Jesus who we know is God's only son. And yes, just as Abraham had said he is there providing himself as that long-awaited Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And so, I mean, how could anyone say that the Old Testament and the New Testament you know, have nothing to do with each other? Because um, they just fit together like a, a puzzle. Amen? All right, anyways, here's Jesus. He is on the cross, right? Uh, he, he's weak, he's in agony, and, and he's dying. And yet, look, look what we see in verse 34. And yet, despite that, we're going to find that his concern is not for himself, but his concern is for others. Because this is what he says. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, that's a pretty heavy statement. And, and, and it's a heavy statement because Jesus is referring to all these people that were right there. Right, so we are talking the religious leaders who sentenced him, right, and and we're talking those who struck him and spit on him and, and mocked him, right. We're talking all the soldiers who took part in his ex execution, um, from from those who laid the whip against his body to those who nailed him on that cross. But you know what he's really doing though, by saying that prayer of forgiveness for all these people, he's just practicing what he preached, amen. Jesus is practicing what he, what he preached. Like when he said, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. So, man, what a loving and forgiving God we serve. Amen? So, there's Jesus, but here's, here's us, right? Here we are, and, and just think of the little petty things that people do to us. And yet, even as professing Christians, man, we get so offended and angry that we refuse to let those little petty things go. And if that is the case, and I think it is for all of us at times, but if that is the case, then since we're right here seeing this, we need to look... Uh, take a really close look at what Jesus is doing here, and, and we need to consider it a wake-up call, right? Because we're not Christians because we, you know, accept God's word or we're just hearers of God's word, but we're Christians because we're doers of God's word. Amen? 
That's what that word Christian means, means Christ-like. So here's the thing. If we're going to be talking the talk, we better be walking the walk. Right? So we need to always be conscious of not only who we are, but also of who we're representing. Amen? We need to be always conscious of who we're representing. Anyways, as Jesus is there, he's, he's forgiven these people. He's, he's praying for them. But while that's taking place, it tells us that they were uh, dividing up his clothes and casting lots, uh, which is from actually the uh, 22nd Psalm. So just another fulfillment of prophecy. So here we are. We've got Jesus, right, the King of kings and the Lord of, Lord, Lord of lords, and right down to the very close on his back, he's sacrificing everything for us. Everything for us, right? Just as it states in 2 Corinthians uh, 8, 9, when it says this, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And that would be spiritually and eternally rich. Spiritually and eternally rich. But now in verse 35, uh, we're told this, said the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him by saying this. They said, he saved others, so let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, if he is the chosen one. Um, that right there is a problem, right? Because if, God, if Jesus is indeed God's Messiah, then if he does save himself, how, how is he going to save others, right? In verse 36 then tells us that the soldiers also came up and they mocked him and they offered him wine vinegar. Um, that was uh, used back then as a, a pain reliever, um, but Jesus refused it because uh, he was there to take the full force of death, you know, for, for all mankind. And then it's in verse 37 uh, that, uh, that they said this. The crowd said, uh, if you are the king of the Jews, then save yourself. If you're the king of the Jews, and save yourself. And as we all know, we know he could have, right? But we also know that Jesus wasn't there to save himself, but Jesus was there to save them, right? To save them and to save you and me. Um, because here's what it says in Romans 5, 8. It tells us that God demonstrated his love for us in this way, and that is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. So, Here's the thing. It was not the nails that held Jesus to that cross. It was his love. Amen. It was his love for sinful man. Uh, now in verse 38, uh, we're told that there was a written notice above him. It was placed on, on the cross. And it read this. It said, uh, this is the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. Now, this notice uh, was something that was placed on the cross to identify the crime that the person being crucified was guilty of. Uh, but king of the Jews, I mean, that really isn't a crime, right? So what I think is going on here, I think Pilate wrote this not so much to mock Jesus, but I think he did it to mock the Jewish leaders, right? Who, in, if, if you go to John's gospel, uh, you, we see that, that it, it was there that they actually went up to Pilate and asked him to change it because they, they didn't want to say, you know, that he was the king of the Jews. They wanted it to say uh, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. Um, but Pilate just said, what I've written, I have written. So, tough noogies. Um, which actually is appropriate, since in reality we know that Jesus really was their king and Messiah. Uh, unfortunately for them, they just didn't recognize it. Uh, and now, as we go to verse 39, we see that there's uh, someone else who's jumping on that slander bandwagon as it tells us that one of the criminals who hung there, now he started hurling uh, insults at him uh, by saying this. He said, aren't you, aren't you the Messiah? Then save yourself and save us. Aren't you the Messiah? Then save yourself and save us. Uh, but now I think it's pretty cool that in verse 40, the other criminal rebuked him. Rebuked him by saying, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence. Or in other words, since you're about to die and face your own judgment, then, then maybe, right, just maybe, you, you just might want to be pleading with God instead of insulting God. 
Uh, and then he says this in verse 41. He says, hey, listen, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing wrong. So here's a guy who recognizes two very important things, right? And, and that is, for one, he knows who he is, right? He knows that he's a sinner. But for two... He knows exactly who Jesus is as well. And that's confirmed in verse 42 when he then said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And in verse 43, Jesus answered him by saying, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And what this is, what this actually is, is it is the very first recorded salvation of the new covenant, right? That new and better covenant that Jesus came to establish, right? Where it is now by grace that we are saved through faith and not of ourselves, right? Or, or, or of our own righteous efforts. But salvation is the gift of God. Gift of God that cannot be earned by works, so no man can boast. All right. So here's this thief. He knew he was guilty. Right? And he knew he was getting exactly what he deserved. And uh, there's a name for that. It's called justice. Right? But yet instead, what does Jesus do? Jesus gives him what he didn't deserve. Name for that also. It's called grace. It's called grace. So here's, here's a criminal being executed. Right? He has no opportunity to atone for his crimes. No opportunity to make amends or to or I provide any penance. But yet, here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells that blessed are the poor in spirit. What's that mean? Well, poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is the realization that our hope and salvation, it is not found in ourselves, but is found only in God. Amen? And so, as we just saw here, the only thing that's required of us is a humble, believing heart and a simple request. A humble, believing heart and a simple request. Now, if you look back a, a few chapters, right, to that publican, right, in that earlier parable by parable of, of Jesus, well, his request was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That was his request. And now to this thief who is next to Jesus on the cross, well, he just says, remember me. Remember me. And that is all it takes. That's all it takes, because as Jesus had said, he said, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast them out. And you know what? Not any different today, people. Right? A humble, believing heart and a simple request by way of a simple prayer is all that God requires. So you know what? Let's do that. Let's do that right now. Let's go to Jesus this morning and accept his grace by bowing our heads and by repeating this prayer together. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe in you. So from this point on, I want to rely on you. So I accept your love by accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So please forgive me. Make all things new. And I will now follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Hey, if you just said that prayer for the first time and you meant it, the Bible says you just became a child of God. Welcome to the family. I mean, that's how easy it is. That's how easy it is. All right. I love you guys. Uh, I pray that God uh, blesses you all this week. Uh, but right now I'm going to get Roger up here. And he is going to close this service with a, a prayer. Uh, again, I love you. I'll see you next Sunday. I praise the Lord for Brother Paul, the way he unpacks this. Okay, I... I I've been to church, you know, different churches and everything, and I've heard the same story multiple times, many, many times, okay? But the way Paul unpacks it and explains it, it just digs deep, okay? And I just thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this place, these people. 
thank you for Pastor Paul and his family. Um, this whole family right here. I just thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. And I just thank you for Jesus, my salvation. Help us to have those humble hearts and like the thief, know where we stand, that Jesus is our salvation. Just thank you, and I pray that you will touch each and every person here and their families. Be with us. Lead God and direct us to your perfect will. And bring us closer to you every day. Every beat of our hearts, every breath we take, Lord, we need you. And I pray that you'll just bring us back to the next point of time. In Jesus' name, amen.